message. Um, but nonetheless, we will continue this morning uh, with the message the Lord has put on my heart. Let's pray, and then we'll get into it. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. You are so good. God, you are such a blessing to our lives. You've given us so much. <clears throat> Lord, as we come to you now, we pray that this word would enter into our minds and bridge that gap between the mind and the heart, Lord. We ask, God, that you would pierce our innermost person, Lord, our innermost man, and we pray and ask, God, that you would reveal the truths of our hearts, Lord. Help us to surrender our hearts to you more fully and help us to see you in today's message. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to continue our sermon series through the book of Matthew. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, one day what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of the, the uh, messages and I'm going to cut that and you'll just hear me repeating that over and over and over again for like 10 minutes. It'd be great. Uh, no, but we're going to continue our sermon series through the book of Matthew. And it's a, it's a really awesome, it's a really interesting book because as you know, it begins the New Testament, right? It's the, it's the first thing you read once you pass over the pages of Malachi, you come into the New Testament and you see the book of Matthew. And again, as I've been reiterating, it's a book written by a Jew for a Jew. It's got implications and it's got application for us today. But the initial audience that Matthew has in mind is a Jewish audience. And he's trying to show the Jewish person from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, right? You remember how the book of Matthew um, starts off? Starts off the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, right? The son of Abraham. This is... The gospel writer going back and saying, see, Jesus has lineage. Jesus, Jesus, the son of David, he's the rightful heir to the throne. He's the rightful heir to the kingdom of heaven. And so as a Jewish person, when you see this, when you see this, you go, oh, okay, it makes, it makes sense now. Of course, it makes sense to us also as Gentiles. We also have something to gain from the book of Matthew. But it's good to see some of the historical context surrounding that. And of course, last week, we, we, we were taking a look at the temptations of Jesus, and uh, we slowed down significantly. We went from doing about half a chapter to a couple verses at a time, because what's happening here in the temptation of Jesus, there's, there's so much inside of that. To really read between the lines and see what's happening underneath it has so much application for us today. And sometimes it's good just to slow right down and consider a small portion of scripture. Always take it in to the grand context of the passage, but really slow down and take in what's being said. Right? The temptation of, of Jesus, Jesus out into the wilderness, speaks to a place of, of dryness, a place of trial, a place of temptation, as Jesus goes out to be tempted of the devil. <coughs> Last week, we took a look at the accusations that Satan was bringing toward him. If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. We talked about how we can often take the temporal things of life and trade them for the eternal promises that God gives us. Right, like Esau. We use the example of Esau, how he was, how he was so hungry when he came in. He was, he was starving, he thought. He, he really needed something to eat. And so for what, the, what Hebrews tells us was what for, for a, a morsel of bread, he sold his birthright. He sold his birthright for a tiny <clears throat> little temporary thing to satisfy the flesh. And of course, we know that he, he thought that he was, he was going to die. But, but I mean, if you really read that, you understand that it wasn't like he was going to snap his fingers and fall down dead right then and there. See, he, he could have waited. He could have waited. Not only could he have waited, he should have waited. He should have waited. See, he wasn't bearing with the temptation, or he wasn't, he wasn't persevering through that feeling of hunger, and he decided to sell his birthright. See, this was the temptation that the devil was giving Jesus in the, in the wilderness here, that he would sell his birthright, or he would sell his right as the son of God for the sake of a little loaf of bread after his 40 days of fasting. Of course, we know how Jesus responded. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Again, let me reiterate, this is the point last week, is this. The word of God, the implication is, 
is much more important than the physical nourishment that we give ourselves on a daily basis. It's more important than the food that you eat. It's more important than the water that you drink. The word of God is the sustenance of our lives. It's, a, it's the sustenance of our spirits. Without the word of God, we don't know the truth of God. And the truth of God is the most important thing that we can obtain as believers. Amen. More important than food. More important than water. It's crazy to think about. But with that being said, let's move on to today's passage. <coughs> We're going to consider the second temptation uh, that Jesus went through. And if you have your Bibles with you, please stand with me. Uh, we're going to read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. That's chapter 4. <coughs> verses 5 to 7. It's Matthew, chapter 4, verses 5 to 7. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Gospel writer writes this. Then the devil took him up <coughs> into the holy city, set him on the pin pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord, your God. <clears throat> you may be seated. So four verses, four verses. If you got your calculators out, again, we'll probably be another 25 years in the book of Matthew. Just kidding, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting passage. So again, I want to point out the fact how the devil begins his temptation with Jesus. Right, we pointed this out before, but I want to spend a little bit more time on it today. He points, he, he says this, he says, he says, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, you see what the devil is doing here is he's, he's throwing this temptation as though Jesus had something to prove to the devil. He's also throwing out this temptation in such a way to say, you know what, maybe God doesn't really love you as much as you think he does. Maybe you're not really the son of God. You see what the devil is doing here? Maybe you're not really the son of God. Again, he, he does that with us today too, right? You're not really a child of God. I saw what you did last week. I saw what you did this morning before you came to church. This is what the devil is doing. Right? He's, he's tempting us in the same way. See, what he's doing here is he's getting Jesus to con try to consider his own uh, personhood, his own value in the face of God. He's trying to get him to doubt who he is in Christ. And it's the same thing with us today, that day after day we are bombarded with temptations suggesting that we are not children of God. This is his tactic. See, if he can get you to stop believing that you are a child of God, then he can get you to do things that somebody who's not a child of God would normally do. See, he's trying to pull away at the relationship between the Son of God and the Father. He's trying to pull away the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. Of course, it's futile because he's Jesus, and his divine nature and his fleshly nature cannot be separated. His human nature, let me rephrase that. They cannot be separated. In much the same way that the Godhead cannot be separated. See, Jesus was in perfect harmony Perfect harmony with God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, the whole idea of the Trinity. Wasn't much of a temptation as far as being able to get Jesus to do what the devil wanted. Nonetheless, he tried. But that lesson is in there for us because it almost seems like looking through the temptations is, is, is you learn as much about the devil as you do about Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So you learn a little bit about the tactics of the devil. See, the first temptation, the devil came to Jesus, and he said this, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be, become bread. Again, he used the same tactic before. He tried a second time with this temptation. If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down. If you are the Son of God. 
So here we have the devil using the same tactic on him. But here's what I want to let you know. Galatians 3.26, when the devil comes to you with this, with this kind of temptation, this sort of ideology, with this, with this way to get you to come off trails, you just need to remember a couple of scriptures. right? Remember Jesus' response to the devil every time the devil tries to tempt him? He says, it is written. So put that in your vocabulary. Put that in your words. It is written. Memorize the scriptures like Jesus has done here. I doubt that when he was, when he was uh, sparring with the devil here that he, he pulled out a scroll from his back pocket and looked up the passages in Deuteronomy. No, Jesus knew the words and he knew the right words to use when the temptation came his way. So listen to this. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. It is written, right? For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Who are you? You're a child of God. Who are you who believe in Jesus? Children of the Most High. What an awesome thing. Listen to this. John chapter 1. We'll spend a bit of time here. Verse 12 to 13. We probably know this. But as many as received him, it's Jesus, to them he gave the right the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now I want to take a look at that word, the right, the right to become the children of God. It's an interesting word. Greek here is exousia. Probably heard that phrase before. We, we are a Pentecostal church. We like to talk about the power. We like to talk about the exousia. But there's a number of definitions for this word. Exousia. The first one being power and authority. Physical power or, or mental capability, right? Like or if you got to go and, and move some weights without throwing out your back, you're said to have exousia, right? You got exousia, you can pull those weights up, no problem. Easy peasy. Got lots of exousia. Or maybe you're you're capable of, of going into a situation and, and getting some tactics all fixed up in your mind and figuring out how to do things. Uh, you, you're said to have mental exousia, mental capability. You're, you're able to do these things physically and mentally. That's one definition of exousia. And we, again, we see that throughout the scriptures, but I don't want to focus too much on that because it's not the definition we're talking about today. The second one is a realm of authority. A realm of authority. Ephesians 2 verse 2 says this, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of, of the disobedience. The power of the air. The power is, is exousia. It's using the word exousia to speak of a specific realm that something is under, that, that is under the authority of another. Right? In the case of Ephesians 2, Paul is talking about the fact that we live in this world where Satan has dominion. Of course, God has dominion fully, completely, but Satan is on a leash and he is doing what he can on the earth today. Part of that is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Part of that is continuing that temptation to those who trust Jesus. The third definition is supernatural being. So not just a realm, but it can also talk of a supernatural being. Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this, uh, the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. And exousia is often used to refer to spiritual powers, Spiritual beings that have capabilities to do things. And we see that very clearly in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Why is this important? It's important because we need to recognize that all the physical things that happen on earth, all the political things that happen on earth, we're not going to get political today. All of the things that you see happen out there in the world system looks very fleshly, looks very natural. But let me tell you this, everything has a supernatural bent to it. There is something happening spiritually behind the scenes of all these decisions that are being made. It's a whole other world out there. And many, many, many are blind to it. The famous C.S. Lewis quote tells us that the devil would be happier 
if we believe that he didn't exist. And we temp typically have that issue here in the West, where, you know, we, we base our lives on the natural sciences. And, and uh, science is good. Don't get me wrong. Science is a good thing. Science is a great thing. Go and learn science. But know that it is not the be-all, end-all. It doesn't answer our questions. It doesn't answer the questions of the spiritual world. It cannot answer the questions of the spiritual world. It can be seen as the wisdom of man. And the wisdom of man can only go so far. You see, we live by what? By faith. By faith we live. Supernatural being. And then the fourth definition, the last one here, is the one we see in our passage here from the Gospel of John. And that is that it's a, it's a right. It's a privilege or a right. It's, it's something that's legally granted to us by the authority of another. So let, let me go back here to our passage. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So when we talk about the right to become children of God, we are talking about a privilege granted to us by the Most High. It is a privilege granted to us. Now this is used elsewhere in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 9, verses 3 to 6. Paul is justifying his stance of making a little bit of money as he ministers the word. And he says this, <clears throat> My defense to those who examine me is this, Do we have no right, exousia, to eat and drink? Of course they do. Right? This, is, this is a rhetorical question. Do we have no right to take along <clears throat> a believing wife? as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So he's using that word, exousia, like it's a, it's a given. It's something that is handed to him from a greater authority. Of course, we look at this and we know who the authority is. The authority is God, that he has a right to do all these things that he's mentioning here because God has granted that authority. God has given him the right to eat and drink, the right to take along a, a believing wife, and uh, the, the right to refrain from working on other things. See, Paul is expressing his link to a higher authority to give him those rights. But he sends it home in verse 8 and 9. Do I say these things as mere men? <coughs> or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it, ox, is it oxen God is concerned about? Is it oxen God is concerned about? That's Paul writing that. That came out a little bit funny, but that's okay. Is it oxen that God is concerned about? That's a good question. No. No, it's not oxen that God is concerned about. It's about his people. It's about his people making a living. But you see, what he's doing here in verse 8 and 9 is he's sending his point home. He's saying, I have the right to do this. Why? Because the law of Moses says I have the right to do this. The law of Moses, a greater authority than myself, says I have a right to do this. This is Paul's uh, point that he's making in this passage. And that really extends to our point that I'm trying to make here today is that when we look at John chapter 1, verse 12 to 14, when we have the right to become children of God, our right is based on the authority of another. It's based on God's authority and what he says and how he says it. It's based on the authority of the Bible. See, Paul went back and he said, you know, this is what Mo the law of Moses said. Now, what we say today is we say this is what the New Testament says. This is what the Bible says. The question is, the Bible says that you are a child of God. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? See, the temptation, the temptation, again, on Jesus is very similar to the temptation that we have today. Is when, when the devil comes to you, and I say the devil, I mean, chances are it's not the actual devil coming to you personally, one of his agents, sure. But when he comes to you and says, you're not a child of God, you have a choice. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the lies of the devil? Just sit back and sulk and say, man, God hates me today. God hates me. 
Or are you going to believe the truth of God's word? Praise the Lord, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God, and no matter what the devil says to me or no matter what the circumstances around me that's making me think otherwise, I believe in Jesus. He's working on me. The Holy Spirit is in me. I am a child of God. There is an internal witness. Romans talks about the witness of the Holy Spirit. His spirit bears record with our spirit that we are sons of God. We are sons of God. Now, it doesn't say that, you know, some guy down the street comes and bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. It doesn't say my brother and sister in the Lord over here bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child. Maybe it does. It says the Holy Spirit. Let me rephrase that. God himself is in you telling you that you are his child. Isn't that an awesome thing? Now, it's interesting The important thing about your right to be a child of God is that it's rooted in the authority of another. And it's only a right because it's granted to you from a higher authority. We're there. So let's take this and and let's look at some some examples we see out there today, right? We talk about rights all the time. If if you uh, you ever get into the political discussion, um, we talk about rights all the time, right? The right to do this, uh, the right to free speech. um, If you're American... You know, the right to bear arms, right? Not to get all political. These are just some rights. The right to freedom of religion. That's something we have apparently in Canada. I say apparently. Um, But, you know, we have these rights. And and, uh, we in Canada have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And and the U.S. has the, uh, uh, what is it, the, the Bill of Rights? Yeah, the Bill of Rights. And what this is, is again, is it's, it's an example of a higher authority, right? When the founding fathers came together, or the, the fathers of the Confederation came together, they wanted to ensure that people would have the ability to live well in the country and to do their thing and to, to live their life without as much inter- with, with as less interference from the government as possible. So they, so they kind of came up with this, these rules or these rights that citizens would have. And again, the purpose of it was to give you freedom in the country in which you're living. Right? So we can have our right to free speech. doesn't mean there's not going to be no consequences to free speech. But you have a right to free speech. You have a right to bear arms if you're American, and, and we have the right to, to freedom of religion. But people have these rights because those who formulated the government thought they were necessary for the country's citizens. Um, and here's the important thing. Here, here's the important thing. These rights are meant to not change. They're meant to be immutable. Immutable just means you cannot change them. It doesn't matter what you do to them. You, you, can't, you can't change them. And in the computer world, if you have an immuta, immutable computer, you can't add programs to it. You can't take away programs to it and stuff like that. It's very secure. It's a very, very great way to compute stuff, blah, blah, blah. But see, the whole point of having these rights is that they do not change. Because if they can change, then they're not really rights, are they? They are determined rights so that people can't just make up their own rules. We have these rights in the charter so that people, someone later, just can't come along and say, eh, I don't like that one. Let's just suspend that one and, and uh, we'll, we'll do away with that one. Of course, if, if these rules, if these rights could change all the time, then it wouldn't be very stable, would it? We wouldn't have a firm grounding to set our feet upon. Part of the reason why America and Canada were such great countries is because of these rights because of these these things which had grounded the country and dare i say that these rights were founded on the truths found in the word of god what a great way to build a country what a great way to build a life founded on the word of god but more importantly more importantly when we come back to our passage here in john it's this the devil cannot change the rights that God has given you. Let me repeat that. The devil cannot change the rights that God has given you. So when you look at the passage and you see that you have the right to become a child of God, for those who believe, that's key, that's important. Okay, the devil can't come and say, yeah, you believed, um, but now I saw what you did there, and so now it's changed. So you're not really son of God. No, that's not how it works. 
You have the right to become a child of God if you believe. And that does not change. God is the same what? Yesterday, today, and forever. Especially when it comes to our salvation. Now here's another interesting fact here. Rights are extended to a group of people under differing authorities. Okay, I'll say that again. Rights are extended to a group of people under differing authorities. What do I mean by that? Okay, an American has the right to bear arms. Okay? So if an American grabbed all their firearms and went to go have some fun somewhere in the States, I would join them. That would be a fun day to just shoot a bunch of stuff, right? That's cool. But see, if, if they were to load up their car and try to cross the border, what's going to happen? You're going to get your guns taken away. Why? Because we don't offer the same rights in Canada as they do in the United States. It's the same thing living the Christian life. You will find yourself with a set of rights. You will have your rights under the devil, which is a right to sin and death. Or you will find your rights under the Savior of the world, which is the right to become the Son of God. Now imagine if you were in a world where you were crossing the border all the time. You want to execute your rights, your Fifth Amendment right. Is it Fifth Amendment? Second Amendment. Second Amendment rights to, to bear arms and to take them into Canada and then come, come back and then use them and then take them into Canada again. That's going to cause some serious problems for you trying to cross the border back and forth all the time. Right? It's the same thing in the Christian life. There's that border there. There's the border of rights to be the child of God and there's the border of rights to be a child of the devil, essentially. And you know, sometimes we find ourselves doing this with the border. You know what I mean? Like, one day we're feeling it, we're praising the Lord and everything, and then another day we, we get tempted and we, we come over here because something's shiny and grabs our attention. Right, that back and forth, oh man, that is bad for the Christian soul. I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation or anything. Now, I think there's, there's a place for apostasy and such. But here's the thing. It's very difficult to have one foot under the rights of God and then another foot under the rights of Satan. You can't do it. In fact, I would imagine if there is someone living in such a way that is probably eating away at their soul because they know better. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit is saying, no, 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 get your other foot over here. And see, that's kind of the essence of the Christian life, isn't it? We receive from the Holy Spirit the ability to live lives which are good to Him. He empowers us to live lives, but we still struggle under the jurisdiction of the flesh. You know what I mean? Of course, we will struggle with that from time to time. We still have the flesh attached to us. And when we die and when we are with Him in glory, we will be free from our flesh. But until then, we wage the fight. We wage the good fight. We listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and we walk in the path that he has chose for us. So it's our right. It's our right, our privilege, granted by God immutably to be called a child of God. <coughs> so let's go on to a couple other observations about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Now, you remember the devil's tactic, right? He says, if you are the son of God, but he changes his tactic a little bit. You remember from the first temptation, remember what Jesus responded with after the devil told him to make the bread into stone? The devil, the devil, or, or Jesus responded by saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, right? We, we come to the conclusion, the word of God is a way to defend ourselves against the attacks of the devil. But see, the devil is not sitting idly by. He sees Jesus defend himself in this way. And you know what he does? He pulls a reversi card, right? You know reversi. And he says to Jesus, you want to say it is written? You know what? It is written. The devil comes up to him and says, it is written. He shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. This is the devil quoting scripture pretty good to Jesus. Interesting, eh? 
So he sees Jesus doing this in the first temptation. He modifies his plan, and then he tries to convince Jesus that the scriptures say these things, which is, which is interesting because the scriptures do say that thing. The scriptures do, in fact, say these. It comes from Psalm 91. We'll read a little bit of that later. But this is interesting because what the devil is doing is he's mixing in some potent truth with a little seed of a lie. Yes, it's true. The Bible says he shall give his, cha- his angels charge over you. Yes, the Bible says in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. It says that. But here's where the issue lies, is the devil is applying it in such a way as to be deceptive and the opposite of what the passage is actually talking about. And it's really interesting, if you're familiar with Psalm 91, why he stops where he does. It's very interesting why he stops there in Psalm 191. We'll get to that in a moment. But here's the thing is, just because, just because someone says the Bible says, hey, I'm, I'm up here saying the Bible says, okay? Just because somebody says the Bible says does not necessarily mean that they're speaking truth. They could be using it to manipulate and to twist things such as Satan is doing here. So here is my encouragement to you. Put on the discernment hat. You're listening to me right now. Put on your discernment hat. Now, I'm not going out to lead you astray, and it's not my intention to lead you astray. But here's the thing is you need to put that discernment hat on. Is he using the Bible like he's supposed to be using the Bible? If we ask that question here, is the devil using the Bible as he's supposed to be using it? The answer is no, he's trying to get the Son of God to renounce his place as the Son of God. He's using it to tempt Jesus. We don't want to do this. He's taking it out of context. He's taking it out of context. We have lots of passages in this this day and age that are often taken out of context. Right, I can think of one. Um, I can think of one. (laughs) It's just not coming at this moment. Ah, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wonderful passage. Wonderful passage. But it's often applied in situations where it has no business being applied. Right? Let me give you an example. Um, Say you're having a test. And uh, you didn't study for your test at all, right? You're in school. you You didn't do any work. You didn't study. You didn't do what you're supposed to do. And uh, the deadline's coming up, and you're, you're a day away, or you're putting it off, you're procrastinating. Um, by the way, I, I procrastinate a lot too, so <laughs> this isn't anyone specifically. But you're procrastinating, and then you come to the very last moment, the very last hour before you're about to sit down and take your exam, and you sit down at the chair, and you get the pencil in your hand, you sit down, and you recite, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, that's not what the passage is about. The passage is not about you passing your exam, though we would pray and we would want you to pass your exam. But here's the thing. You're, you're taking that passage and you're finding comfort in it for a situation that that passage is not speaking to. What is the passage speaking to? The passage is speaking more to contentment. Paul says, I know how to be abased. I know how to be rich. I know how to be poor. I know how to be imprisoned. And I know how to be free. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, that passage is meant for us to to glean from it this idea of contentment. And that as we walk in Christ, we learn to become more and more content like Paul, like Christ. Paul says, I can do all things. That is, he can live in every situation that is brought before him. Oh, what a place to be. That regardless of where you are in life or what may be raining down upon you, to be able to lift your hands up and say, glory to God. Glory to God. We will get there as the work of the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. So the point, just because we say the Bible says, doesn't mean we stop with discernment doesn't mean we stop considering what's being said. doesn't mean we necessarily take it at face value. Yes, even me preaching up here, don't take it at face value. Listen to the points you agree with. Go home and 
listen again and see if you can find something in there that wasn't quite right. If I've said something, bring it to me. I've received a little bit of correction over my time here. But here's the thing. Is you need to have discernment. You need to understand. You need to dig deep. Don't let just a surface level understanding satisfy your soul. Go deep. Go deep. So the, the, the quote from Psalm 91 is interesting. Right? He quotes Psalm 91. Let me just flip over there in my Bible. <coughs> Psalm 91. <coughs> I'm just going to read the first 12 verses. I know that's a lot of scripture, um, but I'm here preaching the Bible, so you're going to get a lot of scripture. That's just how it's going to be. So Psalm 91. <coughs> Listen to this. This kind of feeds into that idea of having the right to be called children of God. Think about that while you're, while you're hearing this. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High <coughs> shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. In him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your right side, and ten thousand at your, uh, at your right, right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked." Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. You see the passage there? That the devil uses. Now, do you see why he stopped where he stopped? You see why he stopped where he stopped? This is so funny. So, sometimes when somebody takes something out of context, all you need to do is oftentimes just read the next verse or the verse before it. You don't even have to go very deep into the context. Sometimes just the next verse. And listen to the next verse, right? You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Now, why didn't the devil quote that? Why did he stop at the verse he stopped at? Because he knew that there's power in that phrase. And he knew that that was talking about him. See, if lest you dash your foot against a stone is talking about Jesus, this is also talking about Jesus. Let me read that again. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Praise the Lord. You see why he stopped where he stopped? You see why the devil did not want to give the full context of this passage? He doesn't like to speak about his own demise. He doesn't like to speak to his own demise. I'm sure if he had a least favorite book of the Bible, I'm sure he doesn't like them at all. But I'm sure the book of Revelation is probably his least favorite. Because he loses hardcore. Like, I mean, he loses. There's no question about how much he loses. <laughs> so let me end with this. <coughs> it is written, when Satan tries to get you to doubt your standing bef before God, remember these truths. Remember these truths. John 15 Chapter 15, verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. What do you think the love between the Father and the Son is like? It's probably pretty intense. It's unbreakable. It's immutable. 
And listen to what he says. He compares his love for you with the love of his father to him. The same immutability that is between the Son and the Father and the Holy Trinity is the same immutability between you and the Savior. Let that sink in for a moment. The same intensity with which God loves, God the Father loves God the Son, the same intensity is the same intensity with which God the Son loves you. Let that sink in. In Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39, we know this one. But this is the intensity of the love of Jesus for you. For I am persuaded, <laughs> this is Paul. You know why he's persuaded? Because he went through the ringer. He went through all the problems that you could imagine. You know what? He was even one of the guys who was hating the church. He persecuted the church. He, he was holding the coats of those who were killing the people in the church. And he received radical forgiveness from God. And it changed his heart. See, he was persuaded. He was persuaded by looking back at what God had done in his own life. He says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Just dwell on that. Dwell on that this week. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you that you love us with an immutable love. Thank you that your love for us does not change Lord, thank you for that, that right, that privilege to be called your son, your daughter, your child. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you so loved us that you died on the cross for us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that even though you went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, that you did this as an example for us, Lord. We pray that you would give us the tools necessary to forego and to avoid and to resist the temptations from the devil. Lord, set our identity in you, Lord, not in what we do, not in how we do things, not in who we know, not in how much money we got, Lord, but let us find our identity fully, fully in you. Help us, Lord, this week to consider your ways, to walk in them, and help us to see you as greater now than when we first walked in here this morning. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.